The following is a Shaw Public Affairs presentation. Constituency Report is produced as a public service by members of the BC Legislature through the facilities of Shaw TV. Hello and welcome to Constituency Report on Shaw TV. My name is Edward May and with us in the studio today is Spencer Chandra Herbert, New Democrat, MLA for Vancouver West End and official opposition critic for tourism, culture and the arts. Welcome back to the show, Spencer. Glad to be joining you, Ed. <laughs> um, now, as of taping right now, Christy Clark and, and David Eby are, are in the by-election in Vancouver, so by the time this show airs, we'll know how the results are. But, but I, was, I was wondering if we could start by asking about your observations so far on the new Premier and the new BC Liberal leader. Oh, thank you, Ed. I, I think one of the things I've noticed is uh, the new leader has talked about change. She said mm -hmm. she's the change candidate. Uh, but right now in the legislature, we're debating the budget. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same budget Gordon Campbell introduced, um, which of course included things like the HST, increases in hydro fi fees, big cuts to the arts uh, and culture, mm -hmm. uh, cuts to tourism, um, environment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the change is certainly not in the budget, and as the budget is the principal action of government, um, is there, there has been no change. Mm -hmm. um, Kevin Falcon is leading the government in the House, of course, the most conservative member of uh, the BC Liberals, um, and we're seeing the, the huge impact on families. Uh, I know I see it in the West End all the time. Um, when she was a radio host, mm -hmm. uh, she would talk with me about dealing with rental housing concerns. Uh, I was on her show many times. However, uh, now that she is Premier and can actually do something about stopping evictions, stopping uh, people being forced out of their homes, mm -hmm. um, there's absolutely nothing on the legislative calendar or agenda to do, to do just that. Mm -hmm. um, I introduced a private member's bill this session, uh, the Residential Tenancy Amendment Act, which would stop the rent evictions, which would stop cases like uh, Emerald Terrace on Nelson Street and uh, the Seafield the uh, on Pendrell, mm -hmm. uh, where they were hit with an attempt at a 73% rent increase. So my bill would stop that um, if the BC Liberals are a changed party and, well, when 99% of their members are the same members that were there before supporting Gordon Campbell. Uh, they're not, but if they truly were, they would enact that legislation uh, right away. Uh, and I've seen no interest at all from Rich Coleman to do that, mm -hmm. uh, which is truly unfortunate for those uh, people who are being forced out of their homes. Mm -hmm. Now, a big, another big ta tagline that Christy Clark is using besides trying to distance herself from the Campbell administration is the putting families first uh, label. And how would you characterize uh, the action uh, as in comparison to, to the sort of slogan? Uh, well, if you want to put families first, and that's something New Democrats have focused on forever, mm -hmm. uh, as long as we've been around as a political party, um, you don't do something like the HST, where you know, a recent report came out suggested it could be $350 per person uh, mm -hmm. or per family. Um, of course, Statistics Canada, a study they did, suggested it was more like $600 mm -hmm. per family. Um, when debt loads are at the highest level uh, in all of Canada, personal debt. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're in a recession, of course, uh, if you want to put families first, you don't increase their costs because that leads them to spend less. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're seeing that in restaurants uh, in particular throughout the West End, a number of favorites have closed uh, in part because of the HST um, mm -hmm. and a number of other ones are struggling and I talked to the servers, I talked to the people who, uh, the owners, uh, and it's been one of their worst years so far uh, and the West End is famous for its restaurants so it has been a real challenge for the families that run those businesses. Mm -hmm. Now the, the, the legislature has been in session and of course part of that is d debating the, the budget which you said is just sort of a carbon copy of the previous one. Um, how would you characterize this, uh, this session? Well, it's an incredibly short session. Mm -hmm. um, I think before we got here, we'd sat for four days uh, out of you know, almost an entire year, um, which is ridiculous. We're legislators. Our job is to be at the legislature taking our constituents' concerns about laws, about budgets, etc. Uh, to the legislature to come up with solutions. But we're only here for four days a week for one month. Uh, so the estimates process, whereby uh, myself as critic, 
will go in and investigate budgets for a ministry, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, I got, I think it was about two, three hours, you know, for hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, at a municipal level, if you think of the park board, which in Vancouver is in the West End, um, they debate spending 50000 of dollars, uh, and that may itself take an hour or two hours, mm -hmm. so versus provincially where we're spending hundreds of millions. Uh, so it doesn't lead to good scrutiny and certainly leads to poor government decisions. Um, so again, we're, we're having fewer sitting days now than we used to have under Gordon Campbell, uh, and that is not good government. And people will ask the question, well, why do you get a big salary MLA if you're not actually over there doing your job? Right. And I agree with them. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, part of the session, of course, is, is question period as well. That's a big part of usually the most watched part mm -hmm. anyway. What, what are some of the big issues New Democrats have raised there? Well, in the last uh, uh, few days, um, there have been questions about BC Parks. Of mm -hmm. course, it's the 100-year anniversary of BC Parks. Um, uh, under the New Democrats, we uh, actually reached uh, over 13 percent of our land base was in parks. Mm -hmm. Well, so we raised the question of why, when it's the 100-year anniversary of BC Parks, uh, do we have a budget that's almost half, uh, it's half of what it used to be in the 90s, mm -hmm. uh, with park rangers not being able to keep the parks safe, uh, so they have to be closed, uh, <laughs> lack of toilet paper in mm -hmm. parks, uh, outhouses being closed, uh, and no management plans, according to the Auditor General, for the vast majority of parks to protect endangered species. So that's one of the, the issues we've raised, because we know British Columbians love our parks, and uh, that's not an acceptable way to, to care for them. Of course, we've spoken about the HST and about how the government used to claim it was the single best thing ever for the economy. Uh, and now, um, you know, they claimed over 100,000 jobs would be created in 10 years, so 10,000 jobs a year. Well, now they've kind of admitted, oh, okay, well, maybe uh, it'll be 20% um, of that number uh, over 20 years. Maybe, uh, not, not including the amount of jobs that we've already lost uh, mm -hmm. in the res restaurant sector, the tourism sector, and other sectors. So, again, a complete lack of credibility. First, they announced they wouldn't do the HST. Then they announced they would do it, the single best thing ever. Now they go, uh, and then they say it's 100,000 jobs. Now it's 20%. That you just can't trust the numbers. So we've asked them very specific questions. Why? Uh, w why do you continue to try to hoodwink the public? Um, this is a tax that is impacting their budgets. Uh, surely uh, we should be uh, actually releasing relevant numbers so people can make their minds up uh, and not be being told they have to vote for it or, you know, the doom and gloom of the future will come. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, putting these two issues together, the new leader of BC Liberals and uh, Premier and, and the House being in session, we, we, we've had a chance to also see the new Democrat, the new new Democrat leader, Adrian Dix, uh, as, as the leader. And I was wondering if you could tell us uh, how you would characterize the big difference between the two and between the two parties. Uh, well, I think Adrian's provided um, very specific questions mm -hmm. in a passionate way uh, with specific solutions. Um, it's been talking about um, well, one, showing how the government has gone wrong, but two, showing what it could do right. Uh, so, for example, Adrian Dix introduced a bill this session uh, to ban cosmetic pesticides. Right. Vancouver has done that uh, and has been arguing for years that the province should do it. Many other municipalities have as well. The BC Liberals have, uh, for years now, refused to do anything about cancer-causing chemicals, uh, which are impacting our children and impacting our general health. Uh, so Adrian is proposing something. The government has an agenda that it could do legislation. It could pass that today. It could bring other good forms of legislation forward today. But there's been no leadership on really any issues this session. Um, when they have a session sitting, they should, they should do something about it to improve people's lives, and they haven't been. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I know Adrian has been out meeting people across the province, um, but his focus is on evidence-based um, action. Mm -hmm. um, rather than, um, you know, I in the north, they want to put in an oil pipeline across the north of B.C. And, of course, we know in Alberta and the Gulf of Mexico, Mexico, et cetera, et cetera, we've had oil leaks, oil spills, mm -hmm. on and on. Adrian has said very clearly, um, the First Nations in the area don't want it. Um, the environmental groups show that there will be oil spills, which will damage the Fraser River headwaters. Um, we can't accept it. Uh, the B.C. Liberals say, well, it's money. Um, but you can't eat money. 
mm -hmm. you know we, we have to respect our natural environment well working with people to develop local jobs Mm -hmm. Now, uh, one of the big issues that's going to be facing British Columbia again, or has really never gone away, is of course the HST, as you mentioned, and, and uh, people will be re receiving their mail-in ballots mm -hmm. mid-June, and they'll have to mail them in by just, just past mid-July. What do you think are the important questions people need to think about, or you think that people th will be thinking about when they decide on, on how to vote in that referendum? Well, I think people will be thinking about their own um, financial circumstances. Um, you know, certainly to be hoodwinked into a tax increase of $350 um, per person or per family or $500, $600 per family. You mm -hmm. know, of course, it will vary per uh, person in British Columbia. Um, you know, how does that uh, help them weather a tough recession? How does that help them in a situation? It doesn't, mm -hmm. um, uh, based on vague promises that the Liberals have made about uh, some future date something good might happen. Uh, so that seems to be, in talking to people on the street, uh, what I'm hearing. Um, I think one other question people will have to deal with is the fact that uh, it's unlimited campaign spending during the referendum period. Mm -hmm. So big businesses which have benefited from a tax shift off of their corporations onto the individual mm -hmm. um, obviously have a big incentive for the HST to stay where it is because they're profiting from the money coming from you and I's pocketbook. Uh, so there will be a lot of fear-mongering, people saying, you know, our economy will die if the HST is defeated. Um, but we have to think about it, you know, for, e for, for me, for you, for the families, for people watching at home. Certainly the personal economies will be better uh, with the HST defeated. Mm -hmm. Now we only have a couple of minutes before the break. Uh, at the break we'll be displaying information of how you can reach Spencer Chandra Herbert in his constituency office, so grab a pen if you have a question. But uh, before the break, I, I wanted to ask about the whole issue of the deception, the HST deception. And I guess the question I have in, re in reference to the referendum is, do you think people will still be thinking about it? And do you think that's, that, that, that is an important aspect to think about uh, during the, the when, when voting? Well, I think with a referendum, um, people bring all sorts of issues to how they vote, just mm -hmm. as in a general election. Certainly, it would send a very strong message to the BC Liberals that they can no longer get away with trying to trick people into supporting things which aren't in their best interests, mm -hmm. like the HST has been done. Um, of course, people will also be thinking about what it means for them and their families, in the West End in particular. I know more and more people have been seeing uh, rising rent costs because landlords are trying to pass on the cost of HST to tenants. Uh, so we've seen a spike in attempts at eviction and a spike uh, to get around residential tenancy legislation, uh, in part because of the HST. Mm -hmm. Um, you defeat the HST, you vote yes to getting rid of it, um, that goes away. Mm -hmm. um, to a certain extent, of mm -hmm. course, uh, we need to change laws as well, but um, you know, that's a lot of what people will be, be thinking about, I think, uh, mm -hmm. when they go into the uh, check their mail and, and vote. Um, of course, one of the things they have to do is, of course, find it in their mailbox first <laughs> uh, and don't throw it away with all the other junk mail right. that people get and vote. Now, of, of, as far as the information that's going out, the government is spending a lot of money and, we, and we've heard a lot about how much money the government is, is spending on, on information and propaganda to try and convince people to vote a certain way, but how much would you say their, their credibility on this issue has been affected by the original deception? Well, you know, if you lied to me once, uh, am I going to trust you the second time you try mm -hmm. it again? Um, People don't trust the numbers that the government has been putting out there because first, you know, as we talked about earlier, they claim incredible job numbers, and then in a subsequent report that shows that, no, those numbers were in, in fact phony. Um, and given that this government's track record of saying one thing and doing another, people are not going to trust them. They're going to have to make a decision for themselves of how it affects them personally. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, of course, government is going to try to spend millions upon millions of dollars to convince people to do something that goes against their own personal self-interest and the interests of their family and, and friends. Uh, but, you know, if people think about it, um, why should we be paying for their deception? Mm -hmm. Well, we have to take a short break. Please stay with us as we continue our conversation with Spencer Chandra Herbert, Herbert New Democrat MLA for Vancouver, West End.
Hello and welcome back to Constituency Report on Shaw TV. Today we're speaking with Spencer Chandra Herbert, new Democrat MLA for Vancouver West End. Spencer, before the break we were talking about the legislative session and, uh, and question period. And one of the uh, issues that I've heard you raise in the question period was about the casino and sort of what was known when. And I was wondering if you could walk us through. This is a very interesting story. I was wondering if you could walk us through a bit of the timeline and, and what you're talking about in the House. Well, for sure. Well, um, Vancouverites and indeed the province will know since it was quite a big story. Uh, a casino was proposed for the site right next to BC Place. Mm -hmm. um, originally, uh, Gordon Campbell announced we're going to have a retractable roof on BC Place Stadium. It'll only cost $365 million. <laughs> well, after the election, we learned that no, actually, it's going to be $563 million. Mm -hmm. uh, they said, oh, well, but don't worry, it'll pay for itself. Okay, well, how's that going to work? Um, then they came forward with this idea of citing a mega casino next to BC Place and suggested that would pay for the roof. Um, well, you know, the government said at the time, the BC Liberals said, there'd been no pre-planning. This group did a request for proposals, came in, uh, wanted to do it, and how exciting. Well, we got evidence this week that suggests that no, uh, PAVCO uh, and the government was working with the casino proponent nine months, if not ten months, before um, they even went to the request for proposals. Mm -hmm. So, the, in fact, uh, the plan all along was to put a casino on that property. Now, how would anybody trust a government when it uh, looks like they were colluding with a casino to site on that location um, and then claim that it was a fair and open, tr transparent process when it clearly wasn't? Well, we should remember some of the key players. Um, when this was first announced, uh, that the casino would be there, the government was considering, do we do a retractable roof or not? Because the costs uh, had skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the key casino players, uh, a fellow uh, Mr. Turner, contacted the minister uh, responsible for BC Place and said, yes, you have to do a retractable roof because otherwise it's a deal breaker and we won't build our casino there. So the minister agreed to go ahead uh, the BC Liberals ag agreed to go ahead with a retractable roof. Well, this player, uh, Mr. Turner, uh, was uh, a huge donor to the BC Liberals. In fact, while his bid, his company Paragon Casino, was considering, um, uh, was being considered for that site um, in the supposed request for proposal process, mm -hmm. uh, his company made a $50,000 donation to the BC Liberals. Um, Paragon Casino then got the, the contract. Um, so again, here we have a BC Liberal insider whose company stands to benefit by an agreement to allow them to be on that site, who stands to benefit even more by having a retractable roof, which is costing the province now $563 million. Then it goes to City Council for them to have their say. Vancouverites spoke out loudly and clearly that they were concerned about uh, a, a large expansion in gaming on that site. So Council voted, okay, we'll allow the casino to move there but not in its expanded form. Right. Well, Pavco then, uh, who had been saying the casino was absolutely necessary to pay for the roof, then said, oh, well, no, it's not. And the BC Liberal Minister uh, said, oh, actually, no, we didn't need the casino. It's all covered. Well, who's it covered by? Mm -hmm. uh, the roof is covered by you and me and all British Columbia taxpayers, not by the casino, uh, not by what they claimed would pay for itself. They now admit it won't pay for itself. So it was a classic case of bait and switch. You mm -hmm. get a retractable roof that will pay for itself. You don't have to worry about it. Um, this casino will have to pay for it. But then the casino fails. Um, and now we all have to pay for it. Right. And there's no plan B. And the reason there's no plan B for that site to help pay for the, the roof is because of what looked like clearly a uh, fixed process from the beginning to reward buddies of the government. Right. Now, th this, this seems very similar almost to the whole BC Rail story and how the bidding was done on... on uh, there, I mean, you'd think the government would alwe already be sensitive to the issue of the at least the optics of sort of that insider deal before a public pr pr a request for proposals go out. Well, we were never supposed to know about this. Right. Um, through digging, investigation, requests uh, for freedom of information requests and more digging, uh, the information started to come out, mm -hmm. and that's why we know about it. Um, but again, this is 
shown to be in project after project how the government has been managing our public procurement uh, and, and contracts being let out to private operators. Um, it's not good government and have, if we were sitting more and we actually had good uh, committee systems here where we could work with liberal members, where we could work with independent members, I would hope uh, that we could stop this kind of thing because it doesn't serve taxpayers, doesn't serve citizens of BC, um, and it doesn't serve the government. Uh, most members on the BC Liberal side, I would imagine, uh, are upset about this because they weren't personally involved. It was just the upper echelons of the party uh, and of the BC Liberal caucus who made these decisions, which are now hurting all British Columbia. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd like to switch the conversation a little bit to, to your constituencies because I want to make sure we hit a couple topics before we, the show wraps up. But uh, one of the things I wanted to ask about is, is a shelter closure. And, and I guess the t I have two questions. One is w what's leading to this closure? And I guess the second question would be part, uh, what, what, are, what are the repercussions of the shelter closing? Oh, well, I, thank you, Ed. I, I love talking about the West End. I could talk mm -hmm. about the West End all day. Um, I love the neighborhood so much. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's such a, pr a privilege to serve. Um, the, the only difficulty of being over in the legislature is I can't be there right. <laughs> working with <laughs> constituents, but that's okay. Uh, my job, uh, to a large extent, is here. Mm -hmm. um, we've been fighting for years to end homelessness in the West End. Uh, we were successful, uh, myself, uh, West End Residents Association, the Community Policing Center, uh, the Business Improvement As uh, Association. We joined forces and got a shelter opened uh, over the winters, uh, the previous two winters, uh, to get people off the streets um, and get them access to services to better their lives. Well, this April, um, that shelter, as it was temporary, closed. Mm -hmm. uh, we said to government beforehand, uh, to the BC Liberal government, we said, okay, if you're going to close this, then we need to make sure there's places for these people to go. Mm -hmm because it's completely unethical and immoral to shut a shelter down and just throw the people back onto the street. Uh, the shelter had been shown uh, through uh, work with the Community Policing Center and the Vancouver Police Department to actually be reducing crime. The St. Paul's Hospital had shown that they'd had fewer visits because mm -hmm. people were uh, getting food, getting showered at the shelter, so, uh, and lives were improving. They had some stability in their life. Mm -hmm. Well, that was all thrown away at the end of this month, the shelter, uh, at the end of April, the shelter closed, and now we're seeing more and more people set up on storefronts and back alleys, uh, people's doorways, uh, trying to find a place to sleep to get out of the rain. Uh, that has not changed for the better. Uh, I know Christy Clark said she would try and address these issues. Well, sending 40 people back onto the streets um, is wrong. Uh, we protested it at the time. Uh, the minister said nothing. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned community policing. I understand you're involved with community policing. Could you talk about that? Uh, of course. Well, the West End Coal Harbor Community Policing Center, um, incredible volunteer organization. Um, I'm working with them on a number of I initiatives in the neighborhood to deal with, you know, crime and those kinds of things. But I've been invited to join the Citizens Police Academy. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm about to start doing that process now with getting to understand all of the different programs the Vancouver Police Department does in our neighborhood mm -hmm. uh, and throughout the city to deal with gangs, to deal with property crime, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I'm very excited about that. Um, I never imagined that I would be a citizen's police, uh, <laughs> but uh, I think it's a good thing because uh, um, I can help bring that knowledge to the community as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, before we get to the end of the show, also I understand you had a, 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 an arts forum, I believe, or an open, open, open house, house recently. Yeah, could you talk about that? Yeah, we have. We just had our community open house. Uh, we have featured the, the artwork of Tico Kerr, a well-known local uh, West End artist, uh, for four days as part of the West End Art Crawl. Uh, I sit on the Business Improvement Association Marketing Committee. Uh, it was an initi initiative of the Business Improvement Association, so we had thousands of people come down to the West End. Uh, help support the local business, but uh, more importantly, I think, support our local artists. So purchasing artwork, seeing uh, our community through an artist's eyes. Uh, we held, uh, my, my office was open for, uh, as it always is, but it was open on the weekends, uh, which is a difference uh, to both get information to constituents, mm -hmm. but really to see the incredible artwork in our community. Uh, given the, the massive cuts, the deepest cuts in uh, arts and culture history in BC from the BC government, 
uh, we've all got to do our little part to support our local artists, and this was one small, small way to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, if there was quite a, a large din when, the, when the, the arts cuts first started really happening, and I was wondering if, if you could talk a little bit about the arts community and, and sort of what, what, where the situation is now with a new BC Liberal leader. Has much changed, mm -hmm. really? We've seen announcements, but the announcements have been made to uh, kind of camouflage what happened. Right. Uh, the BC Liberals cut arts investment by 50%. Uh, threatened cuts of 90 percent, uh, the deepest cuts in BC history. Um, they cut gaming funds and in fact told many of our great festivals, the Fringe Festival, Writers Festival, Dance Festivals, uh, Folk Festivals, etc. They sent them letters saying you are not a community cultural celebration so thus you are not eligible for arts and culture investments. Mm -hmm. Talk about insulting. Right. You know, these festivals which appeal to tens of thousands of people aren't community cultural celebrations. Give me a break. <laughs> uh, but that's what the government suggested. Mm -hmm. And so now we've seen these groups, some of them have had to cut programs. So, for example, uh, uh, Out on Screen has had to cancel its queer history project, mm -hmm. which is all about the history of the GLBT community. That's gone. Uh, we've seen people leave the country. Um, and it's really been very... Uh, bad economics because we know study after study has shown investing in arts and culture brings back more in taxes than otherwise mm -hmm. um, than if you didn't do it at all so we'll keep fighting that fight to uh, support our creative communities excellent well uh, sadly we're out of time but i want to thank you for joining us today spencer thanks so much ed and thank you for watching constituency report on shaw tv we were speaking with spencer chandra herbert new democrat mla for vancouver west end